Hello and welcome to my video. In this one, I'm going to show you how to turn this into this. Also, at the end, I'm going to do a very, very quick painting, probably uh, 10 or 15 minutes, just to show you how quickly you can get started to prepare something for glazing later. So here we are then, yellow ochre, big brush, lots of oil, and off we go. Now then, before we really get into the painting, because it's obvious what I'm doing at the moment here, a few questions and answers. Um, first thing, I use paint by Le Franc and Bourgeois, which is obviously a French make, and uh, you can buy it online. And I go to a, a website called Cultura in France, as it sounds, Cultura. And if you, the site is actually in French, so uh, some people may have trouble navigating it. Before it a little pause quickly. That little bit of yellow in the sky is just an experiment for later. I want to see what I'll, what I can do with that uh, a bit later on. So um, yeah, if you can understand a bit of French, you can go to the Cultura website and you can uh, find the paint. Uh, it's a bit tricky if you don't know the language. It took me a while to get through it, but. Uh, it's possible and so you can buy it online um, the oil that I'm using is uh, linseed oil it's always linseed oil sometimes with a sicative in it which is a drying agent sometimes without it depends on uh, uh, well actually it depends on which bottle is closest to me when I want to grab some oil how's that for lazy painting it's also that's the way I choose my colors whatever's within reach I just grab it and use it um, maybe it's instinctive, I don't know, but I just, uh, I know what I want and uh, I don't sort of um, lay out all my colours on a palette first. I just grab what I need as I need it. The board that I'm uh, painting on, the very wobbly board at the moment, is uh, plywood. Now this is five millimetre thick plywood, which I suppose uh, an eighth of an inch in, uh, in, um, for, for American viewers. Uh, that'll do fine. Don't use cheap plywood. You need something that's got a bit of um, bit of quality to it. You don't want anything that's got too many flaws in the surface. Get it as flat as you can. And um, uh, then I put gesso on it. And the gesso is the standard stuff you buy in shops. It's uh, acrylic based. I do uh, first thing to prepare my board is I sand the board lightly with a fine grade sandpaper which is on a sanding machine I used to do it by hand but actually that's hard work so um, I, I use a sander and then uh, when the first coat is dry which takes about an hour I will sand it again then I'll put another coat of gesso let that dry sand it again so anyway I end up with three coats of gesso and uh, then it's ready to paint um, um, luckily uh, interesting point this um, I'm really glad that the gesso dries quickly because when I get the urge to paint I don't want to hang around I want to get on with it so uh, all you know waiting several hours for something to dry before you can paint on it can actually uh, kill your fervor so that you um, you go off the idea I tend to attack paintings when I when I really feel the need to paint um, what else brushes yeah as usual um, cheap hardware store brushes that's all uh, some people say, oh, well, they're no good. The hairs come out, the bristles come out. So what I do is I um, check them in the shop before I buy them. Uh, There's no good grabbing the either side of the brush to pull out hairs. That won't do it. You have to flick along the length of the brush, left and right. And any loose hairs will come out like little, like little missiles. And um, once you know you've got a brush that isn't going to suddenly go bald on you, uh, you're okay. What else? Uh, Mm, palettes. I do have some palettes, uh, but most of them are so crusted up I can't use them. Um, I use plastic plates. Until I run out of plates, then I'll go on to china plates, because in France they've stopped making plastic plates. Now, um, with the, with the um, magic of editing, you notice that uh, suddenly the red appeared on the sky. I forgot to turn the camera on. It's my fault. Sorry about that. But um, uh, it's not complicated, this bit. Um, as you can see by the slightly crazy way that I'm applying the paint here, just basically putting it on roughly where I think uh, might, it might look good. Sometimes I will paint right over the entire sky and then wipe back, but I've, I've, um, 
sort of refined my technique a little bit just so uh, that I um, put the paint where I think it'll be needed. And it's okay to make a sky red like this. Um, you do get red skies. Uh, I've, I've seen them here all the time. Get some fantastic skies uh, in France. Absolutely, well, I guess anywhere, but you know. I, I, um, I particularly like the skies here because of the landscape. Have you ever heard that term? Oh, I live in a place where there's big skies. Basically, if you live in a place where there's big skies, it just means that you live where somewhere that's reasonably flat or on the top of a very big hill. That makes the sky look bigger. It's an optical illusion. The sky is the same size wherever you go. Now, I'm, I'm teasing the paint away in a few places just to sort of um, knock it back a little bit. And uh, every now and then I sort of intensely uh, wipe away, particularly where the light areas are, just to bring them through. Uh, back to a few questions. Uh, the paper towel is an industrial standard paper towel. Quite tough. Not too much of an embossed pattern on it because I don't want the um, surface to have any mechanical textures. It's as uh, flat as I can get. Don't use the stuff that you would use in your kitchen. It's too fluffy and soft and it will fall apart. Something, uh, something else that I, I'll mention here is um, when you started looking at this video, you might have thought, well, actually, that's quite a nice painting. Why, why does it need changing? Well, you know, my paintings are all about as much drama as I can get into a sky. So uh, I'll push it as far as I can. The thing is, if you're doing this, is know when to stop. Don't go too far. Just push it to the, to the limit of your... Um, Hmm, what's the word I could use for this? Um, I have a drama gauge, I guess. I, I know exactly the amount of drama that I want. And uh, it's, um, I suppose it's borderline foreboding. Maybe that's, uh, that describes it. So I've got my red on the picture. Um, I, I probably um, have decided at this point that... Uh, that's enough. I won't put any more on. What I will be doing is adding a few little white highlights. Now this is, this is a, an interesting point because where does glazing end and painting begin? Uh, I don't know. I tend to think of glazing as anything you do on a painting that's already dry. Maybe that makes sense. I don't know. Um, so when I add white, you may say, oh, he's painting white on there. But in fact, what I'm doing, I'm putting the paint on and then I'm smearing it. Maybe it's glazing. I don't know. Maybe it's blending. This is my slightly larger brush. Um, as, and I, it's a, as clean as possible. You, you don't want to paint a, a brush that's covered in paint when you're at this stage. Uh, and every now and then I'll wipe the brush just to get the residue off because I'm blending. I'm not picking up paint and putting it somewhere else. I don't want to do that. I just want to smudge what I've put on there uh, quickly. As you can see, when you get to this stage, uh, what I'm doing isn't making mud on the picture at all. I don't know whether you've just heard that noise. Uh, the cat is trying to get into my room. Uh, I'm not worried about her coming in and walking paint around. Really, it's uh, if she gets on my keyboard and adds a paragraph to one of the books I'm designing, that uh, is the thing that could be uh, a road to disaster. So there, there we are, a little bit of brush cleaning. No thinners, as you probably know well by now. Uh, I don't use turpentine or thinners. I just wipe the brush clean because any little residue that's left on that brush won't affect the painting. It's, uh, it's so minuscule. And in fact, if it does a little bit, um, look at it this way. It adds to the mystery and the patina of the painting. It adds that little extra something that people will see and say, isn't it amazing how, how that, those colours are coming through there? Well, it could be an accident. Uh, doesn't matter. Happy accident. Now, I'm, I'm particularly wiping the horizon here because I want the... I, want, I always like a little bright brightness on the horizon. Okay, general general smudging, blurring, 
or blending or whatever you call it. A little bit of extra highlight uh, picking out. Sometimes when you work on a painting that's already dry with uh, a very oily paint, you get what's called fracturing, uh, which means that if you, when you put the paint on with the oil, it, it uh, collects on the surface as little beads, little beads of colour and oil, and you want to break them down so that they uh, stick to the surface properly. So that's also what I'm doing here. A little late, well, much later uh, in the painting, I'm going to, as I said at the beginning, I'm going to do another painting at the end, uh, which will be really fast. I'm not going to speed it up. I'm just going to paint it quickly, just to show you how to produce a landscape in a monotone for adding color to later. And that's just, um, I, I, what I'm trying to do is give you confidence. You know, you have to be brave. Uh, don't worry about mistakes. They're, um, sometimes mistakes are actually quite interesting. Taking some of the paint off those dark trees in the foreground, uh, just a little bit, because the yellow that I put on is sort of, you know, in between the trees. It gives the, it gives the illusion of um, the artist spending a lot of time filling in all these colours uh, in all the little gaps. When you put the glaze on, uh, it's just a quick way of uh, applying colour to the lighter areas of your painting. Glazing doesn't necessarily work on the dark parts. Uh, unless you want to add something like a fog or a mist, then that'd be perfect for that, uh, that effect. As usual, I'm watching this um, on my editor, uh, my video editor, just to, um, to, so that I can do the commentary. Then here I had this bright idea. Let's put a little bit of bright red on the horizon. I don't think I keep it. Uh, it's just an experiment, really, just to see how it goes. And again, you see, this is something that you need to do. Don't be afraid of experimenting, because your original painting underneath uh, is, is um, indestructible. If you, if you make a mistake, just take it off. It's not a problem. Of course, if you were doing this at the beginning of a painting, and all the paint was wet, you could be, uh, you could be uh, heading down the road to um, grief and problems. So I'm scumbling away some of that red now. I obviously decided there that it was just a bit too strong. And later I'll be adding white. And for the adding of the white, there we are, my special brush. Um, the good thing about using your fingers is that when you use one finger and you've got paint all over it, you've got another four that are clean. So you just uh, change fingers, or if you want, just wipe your finger. And painting with your hand like this is a very good way of getting a nice sort of glow. Obviously it doesn't leave brush marks. It just uh, You can soften the colour into whatever is the colour that you want to blend into next to it. So there, obviously, I'm working upwards, away from the landscape, because I don't want to, I don't want the white to go on the landscape yet. I will be doing something a bit later um, with a big brush, just to sort of get that glow coming down onto the land, but very a very small amount, just enough to uh, to hint that there is a bit of a glow in the sky. Okay, the big brush. This is the bit I really enjoy, because uh, it's, it's like a little mystery tour on your picture. You never quite know how it's going to come out. So a general blur across, and a quick wipe, and then another. Uh, and of course, if you, if you, the way I'm using the brush here, uh, you, can, um, you can add nice, thin, long clouds on the horizon as well. The brush is the perfect shape for it. And um, here we are now, a little push upwards. See how it suddenly makes a glow. There's all kinds of tricks that you can use in painting, and, and it's, 
I mean, I'll show you as many tricks as I can, you know, quick ways of uh, achieving your aim. But an awful lot of it is down to experimentation. You know, don't be afraid to play with the paint, push it around. Uh, you know, just see what see what you can get from your brush. There, I'm putting a tiny amount onto the landscape. Here's here's something that's. Uh, interesting quite often people people paint the sun you won't see the sun in any of my paintings because quite frankly um you can't paint the sun you could paint it i guess in the evening when it's so shrouded in mist or cloud um that that it sort of just turns into an orange or red ball now a, a, a normal bright sunny day sun if you want to paint that um, you're going to walk into a, a, an absolute world of trouble. It's um, too bright. Let's face it, the sun is too bright. So you, you can't just stand there looking at the sun painting it. It's, it's a bright spot that just is so bright you, you can't possibly paint it. You can paint the effect of sun showing behind clouds, but the actual sun itself, don't do it. It looks wrong. It just doesn't look right in a painting. Unless I said... You know, uh, if you do it as a um, literally a red ball, uh, so I avoid that, and um, I like the effect of sunlight, uh, not the actual sun. It's much more interesting too, I think. Now, randomness in clouds. Okay, uh, I always mention this. You know, the the cauliflower in the sky. I've got nothing against cumulus nimbus clouds. Uh, they're incredible things, but um, when you paint them, you know, don't don't paint them with hard edges. As you paint them, watch out for repeat patterns. Try and paint it so that it is random. Now, how some people have said, how do you find random? Well, again, as you will have heard from me, sometimes I shut my eyes and just let my wrist paint away and just see what happens. That's one way of doing it. Now, some people might have trouble with that. Um, but you have to detach. You've got to detach from the brush uh, because all clouds obviously are completely random shapes. Um, this is why um, I prefer to paint from memory and imagination uh, because um, clouds are all different and it doesn't matter what you do. Some people may say, oh, I've never seen a cloud like that. Well, maybe it hasn't happened yet, so it might one day. I don't think Turner uh, or Constable ever listened to people. It, well, maybe nobody said anything, but, you know, they, they did their own thing. And uh, you must admit, they were very good at it, particularly, particularly Turner. Um, and here, here's something that's interesting. People think that the Impressionists started with uh, Monet and Degas and Manet and Cezanne and uh, all those people. Um, it, it didn't really, because the first Impressionists, in fact, I, I would be so bold to say, the first Impressionist was actually Turner, William Turner. Look at his skies and tell me that's not Impressionism. You know, it's, uh, he, just, he wanted to get a mood over. He didn't want to paint a scientific painting of a cloud. So I, it's my belief. And in fact, um, it, several of my tutors at college uh, mentioned this as well, that they, they considered him to be the first Impressionist. And of course, Turner was laughed at in his lifetime for doing uh, his clouds in that way. And eventually, his not just his clouds, but his landscapes became more, much more Impressionistic as he, uh, as he matured. At this stage, uh, with the palette knife, I'm, uh, I'm not forming clouds, I'm just putting the colour down. The forming comes from what I'm doing here, pushing the paint around and uh, seeing what happens. One thing I have to emphasise is that when you, when you detach from your painting, first of all it will have a much more relaxed look to it, but it means that you, you have to not just do what I'm doing by blending the paint, but every single brush stroke that you make at this stage, I'm I'm analysing every mark, and you have to you have to learn the process of stopping. You must know 
when to stop. Um, for instance, there, right, four or five brush strokes, move to another part of the painting. When that's exactly as you want it, stop. Clean your brush. Find the next bit you're going to work on. Push the paint around. And you have to learn to see when it is time to back off. That's what keeps paintings fresh. Particularly sky. Well, it actually applies to everything. Whatever you do at this stage. At the beginning, it doesn't matter. Just go wild, you know. Uh, as you'll see at the end of this video, I will just um, make up a really quick uh, landscape. Totally from my imagination. Or, well, maybe from my memory. I don't know. Some things from my memory pop up when I'm painting. Um, so it's just, it's freestyle painting. When my students uh, come here to learn... One of the first things I say on their first day is, uh, well, I paint a picture for them to watch and I, I break down what I'm doing. I tell them every single thing I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And um, I say to them, when you start painting, every now and then, stop. If you make a mistake, stop. If you've done something with, say, three brush strokes and it isn't quite right, stop. Now, it may get monotonous and boring for people, but it does work after a while. I, I, successfully, uh, brainwash. <laughs> I successfully brainwash most people who come here. And I always tell them that years from now, um, you'll be sitting somewhere, standing somewhere, painting a picture, and you'll suddenly hear my voice say, stop, and act on it, because uh, it means that you are becoming disciplined in your work. You have, to, you have to see the point where it would be foolish to just keep moving the brush up and down. As I say, you're not painting a door, you're painting a picture. So the thing that you're really after in a painting is uh, not necessarily flatness. Um, you need texture. Texture is the key to showing detail. And as you make texture, texture, whether it's deliberate or accidental, look at the texture you're making and determine which bits you like and which bits you don't like. Obviously, if there's something that you've produced in a landscape, which of course is full of organic shapes and forms, you're not going to want anything that looks mechanical or repetitive. So try to keep it nice and random and um, you, I'm sure you'll find your way to producing paintings similar to this. So that's it for now and uh, here's a bit of a close-up and off we go to the next one. Now what I'm going to do here is um, move on to a very quick painting. Uh, it's going to be made up of sap green, Payne's grey and red ochre. So this is um, really a, a preparation oil sketch for my next video. Um, I sort of know what I'm going to do on this one. I had a little think about it, um, uh, purely because I want to um, show you how quickly you can produce uh, a, a painting. Um, I, I, I decided not to leave it down to uh, experimentation, so I'm just going to sort of go ahead with a, a composition that I've got in my head. And uh, it's going to have water in it, which is unusual for me. Uh, that white shape, which is now obscured, or was obscured by my, is now obscured by my shoulder. That's going to be uh, water of some kind, but that won't really look watery until I do the finished painting. So that will be done with glazes, and as I said, that'll be in my next video. You have to ignore the fact that I'm painting the sky using. Uh, the colours that I mentioned. It doesn't matter at this stage, nothing matters at all really, it's structural. So I'm, I'm sort of composing a structure. That blob up there in the sky is going to be white clouds, believe it or not. I'll just let you watch and uh, um, see how it progresses. Rather than tell you what I'm doing, I'll tell you about what I, what, how I got into this uh, speed painting and stuff is when I was a student, um, because I'd 
I studied fine art, but I also studied graphic design. And it was obvious um, that for graphic design, you have to work quickly. So they encouraged us to produce as many drawings and paintings and uh, sketches and prints and stuff like that as fast as possible. Because of course, in those days, there were no computers. Everything had to be done by hand, all, uh, all artwork. So you imagine labels um, that go on things, um, leaflets, brochures, that sort of stuff. It was all produced by hand. There was no uh, InDesign or Quark Express software, nothing like that. It was just down to um, hard work. So um, that was why you needed to be fast. So if you're working in an ad agency, for instance, and they wanted a design for um, a label that went on a can of beans, um, you needed to come up with a sketch really fast so that they could get it into production. So uh, in, the, in the college, they used to send us out occasionally uh, into the town and they would say, right, um, off you go, go and do five drawings, come back at lunchtime, uh, leave the drawings with the tutor, and then um, after lunch you go back, at, back down into the town. This town was uh, a town called Eastbourne, which is in uh, the south of England. And um, so you would go out and you would draw and paint or whatever it was you were going to do really fast. I didn't usually paint in the street because obviously you needed to... Um, you needed to move around and get to another place quickly and you didn't want to have to uh, carry anything around that was sticky or dripping. So um, we tended to draw with things like uh, Conte, which is compressed charcoal into little square sticks. And you can get quite interesting uh, drawings using Conte. Um, or some, some people use charcoal and uh, they just took along a, a spray can of um, fixative. Or if you wanted really cheap fixative, um, hairspray, just uh, ordinary hairspray. So uh, you would go out and you'd absolutely dash off these five drawings as quickly as possible. Uh, go back for lunch and then after lunch you'd scoot off back down the town again, another five drawings. Sometimes uh, if the tutors were feeling particularly, um, well what's the word, evil? Yeah, evil. Um, they would actually give you a place to go to. So you had to draw quickly and then get yourself to the next spot to draw that. And that, that encouraged you to work even faster because some of your time was taken up traveling. And it was actually very good. At the time, it was uh, a little bit uncomfortable and um, stressful. But when you actually look back on it, uh, it was an immense help later in my career when I had to produce uh, visuals for... Um, uh, design, um, advertising agencies and design studios. So uh, yeah, it was all good practice. Which brings me to another point. Um, lots of people say, how long will it take me to learn how to do this? Well, I, I can't answer that question. It's down to your level of um, uh, expertise. But also there's this other element, there's this other thing that I always tell people, if you're going to paint and you're really serious about painting, develop your obsession. Really get into it. Um, there's, if you have a hobby, um, what's the point unless you do it well? Uh, I'm not a particularly competitive person. But if you're going to do something like this and you really want it to be good, you've got to become slightly obsessed with what you're doing. Um, the way it affects me is that um, I'm continually looking at landscapes. I'm continually looking for compositions in landscapes that I can uh, that I can use, and um, it's quite fun actually going out and spotting places where you think you could actually make a nice painting. Unless, of course, if you're if you're highly imaginative and you just have pictures in your head, that's fine, and um, that does happen. But really, get into it. Don't, don't just do a painting that sort of makes you look at it and go, no, nah, it's okay, you know. Produce something that, that you're proud of. And uh, really, I, I guess if you're going to put it on your wall, you need to be proud of it. So really work at it and um, develop it. And, and But, uh, there's another one, here comes another but. Um, you know, enjoy yourself. It's, painting is great fun. Um, and it becomes a lot more interesting when you don't just treat paint as something that is on a brush that is going onto a surface. Scrub it around, 
push it, scrape it, wipe it, do all kinds of things with it, and you'll find that the paint will start to have a life of its own. And it will also have the effect, when people look at it, they'll say, how did he or she do that? That's amazing. How did you get all those different textures? And how did you get the effect of light on there? And, and um, you know, look, as I always say, and I've said through this uh, video, look for the accidents. Don't work fast, but don't rush. There's a difference between working fast and rushing. Always analyze everything that you're doing. But when you first start, don't be too analytical. Just, just get the paint on, get used to the feeling of paint, get used to how, how it will react when you push it a certain way or scrape it a certain way. It's, uh, I can highly recommend it. It's kept me fed now for, well, longer than I care to remember. So, as we're, come, we're, we're not far from the end of this, I think we're about two or three minutes away, I'll just say my usual stuff. Um, if you're interested in lessons, go to my website, you'll find uh, um, information there about lessons on my retreats page. Uh, the link to my website will be in the box below this video. Um, what else? Um, I have a Patreon page that's in case you feel that you want to donate, which will help me buy paint and materials. Um, and thank you to those of you who already do. It uh, makes life a lot easier. And um, yeah, I guess that's it. Oh, ah, right. Okay. Another thing. Uh, back to teaching. Um, and again, I'm just, oh God, I repeat myself. Um, I also do one-to-one -one lessons where you can come here and be locked in my room with me for five days. Uh, it's between four and five hours a day. It's supposed to be four, but it always goes over. Um, and uh, let me know if you're interested. Contact me through Facebook. Leave me a message on YouTube. Um, comment and uh, I'll get back to you. And the other thing is... Um, Please subscribe. It makes a big difference to YouTubers uh, when people subscribe because it's no secret. Uh, people who have uh, YouTube channels do earn a little bit of money uh, because of the number of views that they get and the number of subscribers they have. The amount of subscribers uh, relates to how many views, particularly the sub subscribers who have hit the little bell icon next to the subscribe button. It uh, does make a difference, so if you're feeling like you want to see more of my work, hit that button. Thank you. So um, I'm off now, and uh, when this is dry, I'll work over it a bit more glazing and um, let you uh, see what you think. Thanks for watching. Bye for now, and uh, take care.